Hello, hello and good afternoon. My name is uh, Cristian Rodriguez Schiffel. I am the Head of Trade and Investment Policy at the World Economic Forum. And together with ICTSD, the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, and the Government of the Netherlands, uh, we're very happy to welcome you to, to this session on facilitating investment for sustainable development. It, we know it is, it is the last session of the day, and we are the only thing separating you from the cocktail and the drinks at the end. So we promise we're going to keep it very lively, uh, and we'll try to finish up by 6.30 sharp so we can, we can continue our way. Uh, we have, uh, together with us, uh, six wonderful speakers today. Uh, to my left is uh, Martin Vandenberg, Director General for Foreign Economic Relations from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, then uh, to Martin's left is Bostian Scalar, the Chief Executive Officer of the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, WIPA. Uh, and then to his left is uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Twerk, the Chief at the International Investment Agreement section on uh, the Division of Investment and Enterprise of UNCTAD. Then to my right, uh, it's Anna Novik, uh, the head of the Investment Division for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. And then finally, sitting here at the panel, uh, Ambassador Chiru Osagwe, the Director General and Chief Negotiator for the Nigerian Office uh, for Trade Negotiations. And then joining us online, and I think you can see you can see him on the screen back there. It's uh, Mr. Howard Mann, who's joining us from, from Canada, uh, the Associate and Senior International Law Advisor at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. Just a very brief note about what we're trying to do today. Uh, together with uh, the government of the Netherlands and ICTSD, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, we've been trying to prompt, uh, to prompt the, uh, uh, the flow of discussions about investment issues here in Geneva through, uh, through the trajectory for investment for sustainable development through the past year or year and a half, uh, trying to support, to support a, a healthy conversation on, on, on these issues. And I think one of, the, one of the key points that we've been trying to drive here is about investment facilitation, and we've been very happy that, that, that this conversation has also reflected on many conversations happening happening in the house uh, and beyond at the moment. So to present uh, the idea behind this trajectory and, 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 and the, the principles that we're trying to, to, to push uh, is uh, we'll leave you first uh, with uh, Mr. Martin Vandenberg. Thank you, uh, Christian. Thank you very much and uh, very happy to do so and talk about the, the private and public investment and sustainability. I think uh, we are all aware that international trade and investment are very relevant drivers for, for development and economic growth. Uh, and through GVCs, they are very much uh, connected. And perhaps uh, global investment is even more important than, than global trade. So there is, uh, and especially if you're connected with the SDGs, an enormous opportunity, but also I think an enormous challenge uh, to get all those uh, investments uh, first organized, but also the investments sustainable. Sustainable, but also responsible. And there I think we have a huge agenda. Uh, we all have a huge agenda. We uh, as the Netherlands organized a, uh, several uh, round tables here in Geneva, as Christian already said, about sustainability of investment, what do we exactly mean by sustainability and how are we getting it organized. But not only in terms of wording but also in terms of implementation. I think uh, several uh, players have an important role to play. Uh, first of all, uh, national governments, and I think that's very also relevant, uh, the discussion of investment facilitation. We had that discussion uh, within the G20, uh, with UNCTAD, the OECD, uh, ICTSD, and I think they play a very, very important role for uh, investment. Uh, then secondly, also the national governments, as I said, also the international organizations and international government organizations play a very important role, the international cooperation. As I said, investments going cross-border, so international cooperation is crucial over here. Uh, and of course, there is a very important role for the private sector, because as we all know, private investment is, is very, very important. So we have to engage uh, also the private sector in this discussion of sustainability and responsibility. And as I said, there is a very important role for the international organizations. So there is a huge ambition, we, uh, ambition, but again, we all have agreed on the sustainable development goals. So we have to find a way on several uh, roads to get uh, investment sustainable 
and to get investment responsible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Maybe we'll move immediately to, to Ambassador Sack where, uh, for, for some reactions. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the panel and um, uh, thank you to all of those, all of you who have come to uh, this panel. I, I think you probably would be more interested uh, in a conversation uh, than a presentation. But let me make a few points. Um, number one is this is an item uh, that is in investment facilitation that is overdue, that has been much delayed and on which we need to exercise leadership, ambition and a degree of aggressiveness uh, in pushing uh, this item of investment facilitation. Uh, not to do so would be extremely foolish uh, in light of the challenges uh, that we face. And what are those challenges? Uh, those challenges are the, the ones that confront um, anyone like me uh, who is in a developing country like Nigeria and you have to deal with a development challenge, a growth challenge, a job creation challenge, and you have to deal with population pressures, and you have to deal with um, key issues um, around structural reforms. So what, what, is the, what is the development logic for investment facilitation? How do we make a case for it? If I think that it's, it's a case that makes itself. But if we did want to make a case uh, for the sake of those who love debates, and I enjoy a bit of that myself, what is it that we have to say? Think about this. Number one would be the trade and investment relationship. They are companion policies. You cannot do one without the other. They're two sides of the same coin. You actually cannot do trade without investment. It is investment that actually uh, provides the turbo boost for trade. So, if investment drives trade. From a trade policy perspective, you would certainly need to facilitate investment to be able to achieve development and growth. To do that, not to do that as, you know, use the popular expression would be a no-brainer. I mean, what on earth would you be doing with trade if you haven't coupled it to the companion policy of investment. It makes no sense whatsoever. Secondly, when you look at trade and investment together, facilitating them, they have an important effect on supporting domestic structural reforms in country. Structural reforms, remember, they could be anything. They could be anything. But let me tell you what they are in Nigeria and in many of the countries I know in our neck of the woods. The structural reform priorities we have are the following. It's good governance. It's fighting corruption. It's the rule of law. It's using transparency, both as an effect of trade and using investment facilitation as an effect of investment to push these areas. Our priority is also creating jobs. Did you listen to uh, Madame Christine Lagarde this morning in the exchange that she had with um, Strive Masiewa? Uh, the guy who was who was the chief executive officer of Econet. 
They had a very healthy and constructive exchange, if you were there in the morning, on job creation. And he was saying that no jobs were being, jobs were not being created in Africa, or fast enough, when Christine Lagarde uh, uh, pushed him. And the whole point of it, I mean, let, let me tell you this on population, so you know exactly what we're dealing with and why we must take the trade and investment facilitation much more seriously and less timidly than we're doing. The population of the African continent now is about 1.5 a billion, approximately 2 billion. By 2050, it would more than double and be about 36% of the world's population. You look at Nigeria alone, we currently have about 190 million people. By 2050, Nigeria's population will be 450 million. Do you know what the IMF has said? That for sub-Saharan Africa, and you have to look at the book by John May and Hans Groth, The Demographic Difficulty, you must look at it, it came out this year. Sub-Saharan Africa shall require 18 to 20 million jobs annually over the next 25 years, over the next 25 years, to cope with the population pressures of the continent. Now, if this doesn't frighten you, not just the Africans, but those who would be at the receiving end of migrant populations, then I'd like to know what else would possibly frighten you. So job creation is a major issue. Uh, that's which is one of the reasons that we have to be bolder, much more aggressive, and much more ambitious, and stop pussyfooting around on the question of investment facilitation. We just need to do a lot more of that. But gravitate out of the region and out of Africa and think about what all our leaders, all your leaders have signed up to, the SDGs. Do you know the figures? There is a 2.5 trillion annual funding gap for the SDGs. How would that gap be covered? You tell me, I know the answer. I think you do as well. It's the floor of investments. To conclude, uh, because I know that uh, uh, the organizers of the panel would need uh, more time for conversation and questions and answers. There's a lot lot to deal with in this area. If we don't push on this issue now, if we don't do this aggressively, believe me, many of the, the global, the ecosystem would be playing with fire in many ways. This is not... This is not scaremongering. This is just dealing with reality. I spent 19 years of my life uh, inside here in the WTO Secretariat uh, before Nigeria decided that they wanted me to do something. But and I know the challenges. It's trade facilitation. It's investment facilitation. And we have to move as aggressively as we can. The reason for it are some of the ones that we have stated, but it's, it's, it's a lot more. It's much more than that. And now is the time to push it in a global economy that's generating more challenges, but still abundant uh, with, uh, with a raft of, uh, of, 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 of opportunities. Uh, to conclude on the note that you know well, Many of our countries want the savoir faire, the knowledge that comes with capital flows. They want innovation. They want to be able to integrate into supply chains. They want, they want to achieve efficiency gains in a world and again, I, I do hope that you all listen to Madame Lagarde this morning where it's it's not really so much as Nigeria's or Ghana's or Senegal's or Cote d'Ivoire's trade surplus. It's about the value added for trade in tasks. It's about value change. And this is what an investment facilitation objective 
and implementation uh, would help um, you all and us um, achieve. I think I wouldn't be on my time, but I'm, I'm sorry about that. Not at all, Ambassador. I can thank you so much for your words and I think your leadership and, and Nigeria's leadership in aggressively uh, pushing this issue and I think you, you succeeded at that, scaring uh, many people in this room, including the moderator. Um, so, but I, I, I think it, it's a good segue toward, towards our ne next speaker, um, Howard Mann, who is, uh, I believe, on the line. Um, was actually has been working together with us uh, through this trajectory uh, as we work towards, of course, not only the promotion of investment, but sustainable investment. So naturally, one of the first questions that we needed to ask ourselves, so what is really sustainable investment? And for that, Howard and, and, and Carl Savant uh, have been working, uh, and I think this is what Howard will present, uh, on trying to outline what will be an indicative list of, of FDI sustainable characteristics. So, so with that, I think Howard can explain a little bit more, if you have more line. Thanks very much, Christian. And uh, I apologize for not being able to be there in person today. Um, it just wasn't possible to, to travel to Geneva for this. Uh, so I hope that uh, participating this way will be useful. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Carl and myself uh, the work that we've been doing. Um, and let me just go here to uh, the origins of, of the idea of a report or a project on characteristics of sustainable investment. What would, how do you define what sustainable investment means today? In the E15 report on investment uh, ways forward, one of the policy options was to develop a working group on defining characteristics of sustainable investment. And the work that Carl and I have been doing uh, tries to set a basis for that. Uh, two concept papers were discussed at uh, ICTSD WEF meetings on the issues, uh, and since that time we've actually added more documentary sources. I'll come back to that in a minute. The goal of the project really developed during the E15 meetings on investment where a number of members of the E15 working group suggested that it was impossible to define what sustainable investment meant, and others of us argued it wasn't impossible at all, that in fact it could be done quite easily, uh, even if not completely. Maybe we won't get a 100% picture, but if we looked across a panoply of different instruments, we could come out with 90 to 95% clarity, at least, as to what the term sustainable investment is. And that would be a pretty good starting point. And that's essentially the challenge that Carl and I took on, was to lead a process that would review a number of instruments uh, and see if, in fact, there was a growing term to coalesce uh, around specific issues. And that's what we, we tried to see if we could uh, determine. Uh, in the first round, we identified 100 different sources of possible characteristics using the range of instruments from international investment agreements, regional intergovernmental processes, UN processes, industry focusing specifically on World Business Council for Sustainable Development Companies, uh, using that as a proxy for leading country uh, companies in the area uh, and civil society documents that were proposing different criteria or characteristics for sustainable investment. The initial results were reviewed at meetings, uh, I think, in May, in uh, June and July, or May and June. Uh, and since then, we've added a number, uh, another 50 texts to make the document more robust. The summary, and I'll come to the details in a minute, so this is essentially the conclusion slide. Um, among the agreements and documents and sources that we looked at that specifically raise sustainable development issues in relation to investment, there is clearly a growing expansion and coherence of what you would call sustainable development characteristics. Uh, there's a trend to move away from general statements, uh, industry should not harm the environment, to much more specific kinds of statements. Industry has to be careful about 
emissions into water, has to manage water properly, has to address climate change issues, and so on, bringing it down to another level of specificity. Uh, Clearly and importantly, especially given the last intervention by our uh, ambassador from Nigeria, there's a very clear movement beyond environmental issues to social and economic development issues. And that is abundantly clear across all actors. And I think that's really the key point here. When we broke down the instruments and looked uh, at different actors, what are what kinds of documents are different actors producing? It's clear that these trends are present across all different actors. So, what we see is not just a situation of policymakers removed from business, removed from industry, saying, "Here's what you should do." What we also really see is industry actors, business actors, saying, "Here is also what we can do and need to do." And there's a very much a coalescence between those two uh, sides, if I can use that word. Um, the identification of, of issues remains an active process. What we found is that the later in time the documents we looked at, the more comprehensive they tend to be, and the more specific they tend to be, and the more they tend to recognize participatory processes and good governance, as critical elements as well. Uh, so those are the general results. If, if we go back to the question, can we identify specific characteristics of sustainable investment that help us define what it means? The answer from this conclusion slide is, is very much yes we can, and in fact the evidence and the empirical research supports that. We found a certain group of core characteristics looking across both time and content uh, parameters. Um, and uh, among those now, we see a low carbon footprint addressing climate change much more directly, labor rights, workplace safety issues, non discrimination in human rights issues, settlement transparency. Uh, issues relating to supply chain standards and the responsibility of industry in relation to their supply chains. We see a broader recognition again of stakeholder engagement and legal compliance. Compliance with the applicable law in the host state uh, is clearly emerging as a critical uh, factor. But when we look uh, ahead and on a time series, what, what is emerging? And so we call them emerging core characteristics uh, based on the criteria of one third of the instruments in at least three of the stakeholder groups. So business, industry, international organizations, international agreements, and so on. Here you see very much growth in economic and social factors that's emerging uh, in that kind of analysis. So very much reflective of the development of the SDGs, very much reflective of um, the need for sustainable development uh, to be a truly integrated um, concept for uh, all stakeholders and, and for the all stakeholders to be equally engaged in. Uh, interestingly enough, we also see much stronger evidence of the governance component that's been raised emerging in that context as well. I'm just going to show, I'm not going to try and go through the detailed charts, but here you see, uh, and you'll be able to have access to this. The final report, by the way, will be issued, we hope, at the end of October or by the end of October. But you can see the detailed kind of analysis and that was done using this economic dimensions of sustainable development and the kinds of specific uh, issues that are raised, and the same thing for environmental dimensions, uh, social and governance dimensions. So that's the kind of analysis that we did and mapping uh, in the exercise. In terms of future users, um, we see it, it obviously open for the negotiation of investment agreements, including the uh, agreement on investment facilitation with binding documents, non-binding documents, facilitator, or, or whatever the case, 
And I think in that perspective, the key issue is to ask facilitation of what kind of investment. Uh, facilitation of investment not look the same thing as facilitation of sustainable investment if we are correct that governments have to be much more engaged and certainly this is underlined in UNCAD's work uh, governments need to be engaged in setting the policy frameworks in order to ensure that sustainable uh, investment is in fact the result uh, and not just any form of investment which may or may not be sustainable so when we talk about facilitation what does that mean in terms of these characteristics what needs to be facilitated to achieve the kinds of characteristics that are being identified and talked about and then the whole I, I don't want to go beyond this into the detail at every level and go way beyond my time but I think you can see how the characteristics can be used in terms of investment promotion agencies uh, home countries supporting their firms that invest abroad in relation to investment treaty disputes uh, and so on and so forth. So I'll leave the presentation at that. The tables will be obviously in the final report and available on the PowerPoint. So I'll, I'll end here for now and make sure we have time for discussion. Thank you. Howard, thanks so much. And if you can stay with us for, for, for the Q&A period. Uh, um, and, and of course, to, to the audience, the, the, the report is very much a work in progress, but hopefully it will be publicly available soon. Um, from, from our side. Um, we've heard about the political will, we've heard about the urgency, we just now heard about the scope. Um, and the next speaker is uh, Lisi, uh, Elizabeth Turk, who is uh, setting up her PowerPoint at the moment. Uh, Elizabeth, um, given, given what we've heard uh, right now, I think what is what the system can actually do uh, to support sustainable investment facilitation um, from Nantes, uh If, okay. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christian, for uh, for giving me the floor. Thank you to the organizers for inviting Anktat's investment division to that debate here today. It's a very, very pertinent topic for us in Anktat's uh, division on investment uh, and enterprise. Our vision very much is to work with countries, developing and developed alike, to help them harness investment for sustainable development. So linking investment and sustainable development really is at the core of our work. And for us, that means two things, helping countries attract investment and helping countries benefit from investment. So here questions such as what is the right type of investment, issues that Howie went into are very, very important. Equally important are questions surrounding the right to regulate and what can countries do in order to actually generate the expected development benefits from investment. I was asked to talk a little bit about um, um, uh, what the international system can contribute in that regard. So I'll do that, a few charts on what we see as the international investment system, then show you some of UNCTAD's policy tools. We have sort of outside the room deposited several of our policy tools that uh, help countries design policies that attract and make countries benefit from investment. And I'll close by saying a few words on investment facilitation. I think Howie already uh, really pointed to the crux of the issue. How do we link now facilitation with sustainable development? And that's, I think, uh, the, the really the, the multi-million dollar question. So uh, what do we see in terms of like investment facilit uh, the investment regime? Uh, what is the international investment regime? What uh, can or cannot contribute here? When we talk about the international investment regime, in UNCTAD we talk about international investment agreements. Uh, there are at the moment 3,300 international investment treaties. Those are, I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller, those are uh, bilateral investment treaties that can be free trade treaties, free trade agreements with an investment component. Um, they have been negotiated for several decades with a peak of negotiating activity in the 90s. You can see in the chart in the middle, the high bars representing more than 200 agreements concluded per year. Negotiating activity has somewhat slowed down in 2016. We only saw 37 new treaties being included, noting, however, that some of these treaties are regional, including major regional treaties. So what do these treaties do? Countries conclude them with a view to attract investment. The international investment system is not only made by treaties, it's also made by international investment disputes. 
So in ANCTA, we also track international investment disputes, and that's somewhat tricky because not all of dispute, these disputes are in the public domain. So we maintain a database trying to search for the disputes, these are disputes where foreign investors bring claims against host countries. And according to our most recent data, we updated it just in July this year, we know by now about 817 treaty-based known investor state disputes in the cases. Um, uh, last year we had uh, around close to 70 uh, cases and we have around 35 cases already for this year. We will update the data again by the end of the year. So investors basically use the agreements that governments are concluding to attract investment uh, also as a remedy when they feel that host countries have not complied with the obligations, when they have maybe violated the legitimate expectations of investors. What is interesting to see here for anybody working on investment and treaties on investment, um, that most of the disputes only started arising after the bulk of negotiating activity. So what we say in Arctic is that by now there is lots of lessons learned from these disputes about what international treaties should look like. These international investment disputes, the amount of money that has been involved and also the public policies that sometimes they challenge, there are amongst others disputes challenging environmental policies, social policies, they have given rise to a big public debate about the validity of the regime. And I think the introductory note to this meeting talked about some negative criticism the system has obtained. And in UNCTAD we have recognized this already some years ago in 2010 when uh, we came up with a the, uh, the work program that looks at systematic, sustainable, development-oriented reform of the IRA regime. So that is really in response to the public criticism about the, the, the international investment agreements. And this public criticism is not only in the media, it's also prevalent in parliamentary hearings and in uh, go government committees that are responsible for designing these treaties. And if you look at the debate over the years, you realize that by now, in 2017, the question is not anymore whether or not the international investment regime needs reform. Today, the question is only about the what, the extent, and the how of reform. So it has been recognized that the international investment system maybe is not as optimal as it was expected to be, and governments are working proactively in finding what are possible ways to reform this. UNCTAD, I'm proud to say, has been at the forefront of that debate and we have come up with a series of policy tools that help countries in this regard. One of our first policy tools from 2015 and updated, into, uh, uh, updated in 2015, we already did it in 2012, is our investment policy framework for sustainable development. And uh, uh, if you look already at the title of that uh, document, it's a policy framework for investment for sustainable development. So we really look at national investment policies, but also at international investment agreements and give options for countries how you can you design these policies at the national and international level to make them work better for sustainable development. We preface all of this by a set of guiding principles. Very, very importantly, if you look at the UNCTAD toolkits, and I really would invite you after the session to take the material from the door outside. We have several copies of the policy framework there. It's a policy framework giving options. So we are not prescriptive in terms of what is the best option, but we allow policymakers to pick and choose and see which of the sustainable development oriented policies would work for me, for my country's particular situation. Um, Maybe brief mention here, as I already said, like there are core principles in that uh, policy framework, core principles which actually also have found their reflection in some of the principles being adopted by important groups of countries such as the G20. And again, if you look at the UNCTAD core principles, you see that the overarching principle is investment for sustainable development. So that's really what guides all our work and what guides our research and thinking in that regard. Other important principles that matter when we talk about sustainable development are, for example, the need for balance between rights and obligations, the right to regulate, and corporate social responsibility. And I think that's also the issues Howie mentioned in his presentation. Let's fast forward now, again to 2015, when we came up with a second toolkit, the Roadmap for Reform. So here we are really zooming into a reform of the system. And uh, we have come up with six guidelines, five areas and four levels of reform. Again, the document is available for you outside the room. 
let's look at the six guidelines. The first guideline already says harness IAAs, harness international investment agreements for sustainable development. So again, it's up from there. What are the five areas of reform? Some of them are very, very prominent in today's debate. For example, reforming investment dispute settlement. You might all be aware of the debates about the multilateral investment court, about the concerns with the system. Um, uh, you might also be aware about uh, the debate about promoting and facilitating investment. Let me point you to two reform areas out of the five that matter particularly when we look at harnessing international investment for sustainable development. And the two are, on the one hand, ensuring responsible investment. And that's exactly where Howie's presentation is coming in. How do we define responsible investment and what can we do to foster it? And secondly, safeguarding the right to regulate while providing protection. At the beginning, I said like there are two dimensions, attracting investment, attracting the right investment. So here, the responsibility dimension, ensuring responsible dimension, and ensuring that we can benefit from investment maybe preserving a certain degree of the right to regulate for governments to regulate investment to ensure that the benefits outweigh the cost. Our last policy toolkit, now we are zooming uh, to 2017, is uh, what to do for what to do with the existing stock of treaties, like the past policy toolkits, the policy framework, the roadmap for reform, are giving options for countries to design new treaties. This year we looked particularly at what you can do with the old treaties, knowing that many treaties were negotiated in the mid-90s, up to 200 treaties per year, and uh, there's a stock of old treaties that is maybe not modern, not up to date, and we come up with 10 options what to do with them. Again, one option of particular relevance for your discussion here today, that's the option of referencing global standards. That's referencing these type of sustainability standards, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, uh, sustainability goals, including those uh, the Sustainable Development Goals adopted by the United Nations, referencing them in international investment agreements. For us, that's one way forward to ensure that the international investment system can contribute better to sustainable development. So what has happened? I'm uh, going to choose one of our slides in terms of presenting evidence on where we stand. Yeah? Uh, we track agreements, uh, we don't only count them, as you have seen in the first chart, we also look at their content. And um, I think here our findings concur very, very much with those presented by Howie before. We have tried to map agreements and grouping them into old and new agreements. We have decided to do the cutoff here by 2010. And um, we map them according to all sorts of features, in altogether 150 features. Yeah? So on this chart you see some of the relevant ones. I've marked two that matter for our debate here today. The first one would be reference in the preamble of the agreements to issues such as sustainable development, public policies, environment, health, and so far. If you look at the data, the old agreements, 8% reference sustainable development in the preamble. In the new agreements, 56. So there is a clear shift. There is a clear shift that in the last five years, treaties look different. Treaties are negotiated with more sustainability in mind. The second element that maybe is of particular importance for your debate here today, again picking up on what Howie said before, is reference to CSR, CSR clauses, CSR standards. Again, we map them. Here the data is even more striking. Looking at the old agreements, those concluded until 2010, actually we hardly found any reference to CSR issues. Looking at the new agreements, we find CSR references in more than 20% of the treaties. Yeah, so this slide is really to show you how the IRA universe, the international investment system, which I was asked to talk about, is evolving. It's evolving in numbers, we saw at the beginning. It's evolving in content, we are seeing here on the slide. And I'm proud to say that many of the new treaties, many of the modern features that we map, that we trace by looking at the treaties, are based on the UNCTAD policy toolkits that I presented to you, the policy framework, the roadmap for reform. And I hope that also our action points for dealing with the existing stock of treaties will find reflection. Now, let us come to the last part of my presentation, investment facilitation, and I think that's really the hot topic of the debate here in Geneva, in that building particularly, and I think in UNCTAD we are always very careful to preface our remarks on that issue, saying that the UNCTAD Secretariat does not have a view as to whether facilitation, investment facilitation should be taken up by the WTO or not. 
we see that this is an important decision to be taken by member states. It's an important decision that uh, requires careful uh, analysis uh, based on facts and, and careful evaluation of all the pros and cons. We do recognize, and I think we have been at the forefront of arguing for the importance of investment facilitation as a policy scene. So uh, in UNCTAD in 2016 already, we launched our global action menu for investment facilitation. We launched the action menu in 2016, but it is really the accumulated expertise of several, area, uh, several years of work that UNCTAD has undertaken on investment facilitation in the area of research, in the area of technical assistance, and some might have been, some of you might have attended the informal dialogue yesterday where a colleague of mine presented UNCTAD's work on technical assistance for investment facilitation. We have also worked on investment facilitation in our intergovernmental consensus building. Our action menu was endorsed by the UNCTAD Trade and Development Board in December 2016. So what does the action menu do? And basically, again, it gives options. Our action menu gives 10 options, 10 action lines, what countries can do to facilitate investment. So again, we are not prescriptive, we give options and each of the 10 action lines has some options for member states, for policymakers to pick and choose to see that's my option, that's what I'm going to use and I'm going to uh, uh, implement it uh, in the, the near or medium future. So what are the action lines in UNCTAD's action menu for investment facilitation? For example, there is the action line on promoting accessibility and transparency in investment policy. There is the action line on enhancing predictability, on improving efficiency of uh, administrative procedures. And I think those are the, the themes that have been picked up already quite a lot in the debate here in this house and also in, in other policy circles. The action, uh, UNCTAD action menu has, has further action lines such as building constructive stakeholder relationships, establishing monitoring reviews, enhancing international cooperation, strengthening the investment facilitation efforts in developing countries, complementing investment facilitation in international investment agreements. Yeah, so we provide a whole action menu. If we now think about the type of issues that have come to the forefront of the debate, uh, I think there is one important question, and it's the question that Howard raised before. If we look at harnessing investment facilitation for sustainable development, and I think that is what we are all striving to do, my key question here to all of you would be, how do we actually do that? If you talk about transparent uh, policy making, are you going to differentiate between good investment and bad investment? Are you going to say you're only going to be transparent for sustainable development friendly investment and not to others? The same with the action line of predictability, stability. Are you going to differentiate between sustainable development friendly investment and other investment? If you talk about the efficiency of administrative procedures, how will that work? How will you actually channel that towards sustainable development friendly investment? And I think that's one of the crucial, crucial questions that we all have to ask ourselves if we want to move forward on creating rules on international investment facilitation, how do we actually ensure that these rules that are being discussed now, maybe in the possibility of looking at transparency, predictability and so forth, how do we then catch the curve, how do we get the curve harnessing this for ISTE? I think that's, that's the key question. We have started looking at that in UNCTAD. Uh, we don't have the, the, the answer to it, but I'm proud to say that amongst our 10 action lines, and all the sub-action lines that we have there. If you could wrap it up in two minutes. Yep. We do have some that particularly look at the sustainability dimension. So for example, our action line four incorporates the point to promote improved standards of corporate governments, governance and responsible business conduct. Our action line seven has the item of collaborating on anti-corruption in the investment process. Our action line eight has the idea to build capacity in helping countries to do better environmental and social impact assessment of investment. And our action line full, uh, nine is full of the sustainability dimension. It's about talking, uh, improving the expertise of investment promotion agencies, and we might hear from Mr. Scala about that, to, to foster the IPA's work on green investments and social investment on the type of sustainable development investments that we want to generate. So to wrap up here is, 
investment facilitation is very, very important and we are proud to have developed a policy tool already in 2016. A policy tool that gives ample options and that does not only look at transparency, predictability and stability, but that tries to bring the investment for sustainable development dimension into the discourse. And I think if one is interested in moving forward to harnessing the current debate and to maybe aggressively, as we heard before, push that debate, let's push it towards sustainable development and let's look at what we can do to shift the agenda towards this. So I think I will close it here. It's a very, very important topic, all of that, and I'm going to close by inviting you all to our high-level IIA conference that will take place uh, early October in the Palais des Nations. We will have three days of debate to look at the issues I presented here to you, to look at trends in the investment regimes. We're going to look at the treaties, we're going to look at the cases. We will use the ANCTA toolkit, the policy framework, the roadmap, and the, the 10 options for phase two. We will review progress. We see where do treaties stand. Do they look more sustainable development friendly today than in the past? We will share experiences and we will try to chart the way forward towards making the international investment system one that contributes effectively towards sustainable development. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you for uh, devoting that dialogue to a topic that is really, really crucial at that juncture of time. Thank you very much and we surely heard about the, the tools and the work that ACTA has been doing uh, for, for a very, very long time on, on this issue. Howard, I believe you may have your mic uh, unmuted. It would be super helpful if you can mute it uh, for some background noise, if you can mute your mic. Otherwise. Anna, um, of course the OECD works on treaties, works on reform and works uh, very much on many of these issues that, 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 that Elizabeth has pointed out, also from the UNCTAD side. But maybe if you could just, uh, if you could just frame, frame your, uh, your remarks on, on the title of this panel, on facilitating investment for sustainable development, and what is really investment facilitation can do in particular for sustainable development. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, panel. Um, I, I have to say that let, I want to come back to this uh, context because I, before, I, but I will answer. Uh, don't worry, I will not be long. But mm -hmm. I think that we have an important challenge, and and then the ambassador mentioned this important challenge: is the sustainable development goal, is the is the, is the climate change uh, COP 21 commitment, and and we all know we all we all also know, as you mentioned, that the the need of investment is tremendous. It's trillions of dollars, and private investment, in particular FDI, is part of this uh, kind of solution or need to mobilize them. Uh, in the past decades, uh, we, we, we have seen that a lot of uh, developing countries are receiving a lot of in flow of for foreign direct investment. And if we see at the beginning of the 90s, it was more developed countries, but now with the South-South, with the crisis, the economic crisis, we see a lot of developing countries receiving. However, in the last uh, numbers that we have in 2016 we see that the decrease of FDI was 7% in the in the in the world and 20% in developing world and means that there is something that is a trend that is not stable and it's not forever and then the question is that we want to attract more but also the question is that we don't want to attract just more but we want to attract sustainable investment and this is the reason what we are here and then the question is that if an investment facilitation tool will help us to attract the sustainable investment. Um, we have been discussing this investment facilitation issue, the UNCTA just presented the staff, we're discussing the G20 in the OECD a little also, and now I'm, I'm very glad that the WTO also is having this kind of discussion in this house because I think that different international organizations see the issues from different parts and then the, this is the house of the rules, I mean, and I'm very happy. However, and just the way that the OECD see this issue is like, a, we, don't, we, we see that investment facilitation is part of a big policy package of investment or of policies to attract investment. That is not the only element that we, we, we need to take into account. The, if, if you see the heterogeneity of investment investors, the, the way of the investor taking decisions, the way that trade and investment is linked, as Ambassador also mentioned, I think that it's important to see that investment facilitation is one piece that help, but it's one piece of a big package of policies. But I have to say that it help. Measures that provide transparency, predictability, efficiency in the administrative procedures are, are useful. And I think that any effort to reduce um, kind of uh, obstacles for investors, facilitate cl cl transparency of the procedures that you are uh, having in your countries, reduce the cost of doing business, without doubt, will help to attract investment. However, and this is an important message that I want to give because I think that it's the Martin message, I think that uh, for making this investment 
a, or creating a positive impact in the society, I think that we need to do something else. And what we need to do, and this is something that we are working with countries, is that to have a policy framework that is uh, coherent with uh, many, many different policies. And I will explain a little about that. And then the business also have an important role. And this is the call that we, uh, we do to business on responsible business conduct. Uh, this was a discussion that I have before with Philip, but I think that more of the people here called corporate social responsibility. We try to, to talk about responsible business conduct because we think that it's not just a social issue. It's a responsible, it's a way to operate in a responsible way. For this reason, I think that, but it's, at the end, it's the same concept. <laughs> uh, let me explain you how we work with that because I think that it's a little what you were talking. You were talking of the need to have some structural reform. In a way, we think that uh, we have a policy framework of investment in the OECD where we use the, we do investment policy review and we consider 12 different policies, competition, trade, tax. Uh, we, we have the advantage in the OECD that all these policies are, 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 are in the OECD. And we try to see how in this coherence of application of, of policies, you create an environment that is attractive for investment. Investment facilitation is, a, is part of this package, but this big kind of uh, policies are, 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 are necessary. We updated these instruments in 2015. We are doing some investment policy re review with some Asian countries, and also we have some regional uh, approach with this investment policy review. The other element that we have is this responsible business conduct, that we, is the m &E declaration. It's interesting because in the OECD, since the 70s, when we start to work on these investment issues, we create this declaration that is, includes some investment liberalization, open market, but at the same time, these M&E guidelines that said, you go there, the, the, we will open the, 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 the economies for you, but then you have to behave responsible. In 40 years, the world has changing. The investors are different, the trends are different, and I would say that what is more different is the way of doing business. And then this is the issue that uh, also you, Ambassador, were mentioning in terms of the global value chain. Trade and investment right now are linked in a way that you cannot distinguish with, be, between one and the other. And in, in a way, we are just having a, a joint project in the OECD that we are trying to see, detect how business are like doing, when they do join, when they go to subsidy, when they go to licenses and just like this, and then provide more evidence to this kind of linkage. Because of this, we also updated our m &E guidelines or responsible business conduct standard, and we start to work more since the 2011 on the due diligence issues. And it's a matrix of risk. We are working with business, but also we develop these guidelines with other stakeholders to detect what are the what are the risks that they will have in the supply chain? Because it's not just the responsibility that you have in your direct operation, but it's the responsibility that you have in the supply chain. And you can see that from the business perspective, it's a huge issue because how you are responsible of what happened, the Rana Plaza was a big issue that created all this kind of discussion. And then the human right, remember in the United Nations human rights and business approval of the principle also is this due diligence there. But then. What create there is that we need to help the business to be responsible, but also guide, and then we are developing with them and others, the risk and how far they can be responsible. Everyone has to be responsible in the, in the, in the supply chain, the, the, the retailers, the operator, the, produ the, the production. I mean, that this is an area that I think that is important. And just to wrap up, I have to say that uh, I think that it's important to have these platforms in, in a way that platform for discussing with evidence, evidence of what is going on, what is the business reality, what is the different type of investment, uh, what are, what, what, how we can ensure this positive impact, that we create rules, that we create standards, but the most important is that we implement these standards, because many, many times we have rules, we have standards, but then if we cannot implement, we cannot ensure the positive uh, impact of, of, of the investment. So fast, I finish. <laughs> but I'm ready for any question. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we, have, we're, we have come to, to our last speaker. Uh, we heard about the, the political will. We heard about the urgency. We heard about the scope from Elizabeth. Uh, we, uh, about, the, about the scope, sorry, from Howard, about the tools from Elizabeth. We heard a little bit even about the business case from Anna. Uh, but now we have the man with the job, 
the investment promotion agency, the, the, the person that actually needs to, needs to implement uh, and that works on the ground. Because, uh, of course, we have uh, in this house and in many places a broad discussion about how, how the framework can support investment facilitation. But, Bostian, you're the guy actually working on the ground trying to see what this means. So, your remark. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I hope that all what you said now, that all the stakeholders committed to to serve to the IPAs, to be able to execute. So if this is f like this, then I'm super happy, actually. <laughs> so let me elaborate a bit about uh, how the IPAs see the situation and how they are doing about the achieving sustainable development goals or, let's say, sustainable investments. Uh, I guess we should all agree that uh, sustainable goals should not be just like a ticking the boxes uh, exercise, but should be a tangible actions in all phases of investment promotion activities and eventually also be embedded into the FDI targets, uh, aftercare and also policy advocacy activities, especially the policy advocacy, because they can provide to governments a proper response what the investor wants because at the end uh, investment is about investors so uh, they have some particular uh, requests so uh, the sector strategy for inward investment should be incorporate sustainable development and i would say in let's say three points through the identifying the sectors where fdi can have a direct impact on sustainable development like in re renewable energy investment projects ecotourism organic agriculture can be where fdi can play an indirect role so especially through the technology transfer and specialist services and products that address key sustainable development issues and the third one targeting types of project within all target sectors that minimize threats caused by pollution, natural resource depletion, intensive agriculture, and so on. So what we can uh, find it here is the most important element is coordination. So the ideally must be no overlapping, uh, no overlapping responsibilities and lack of support from other organizations and government bodies uh, for proper facilitation. Uh, so we said that facilitation is task that involves more parts than just the IPAs. Instead, there should be a clear vision and clear distribution of responsibilities and an approach that is tailor-made. Uh, so what we said before, first identifying sectors and companies, then targeting the types of projects, and then communicating this to the potential investors. It's very intensive work, but it's beneficial. So how to assist IPAs? I would uh, agree with uh, Howard and also the Carl Sawan, with whom we are also working, like a uh, view on international support program that is needed. And uh, he also pointed out that the key premise is the importance and urgency of creating more favorable conditions for sustainable FDI flows to meet the investment needs of the future. So international support program uh, should be somehow uh, put in place. And on the other hand, on the un one hand, it's crucial that uh, the IPAs are assisted by their governments. So let's not forget that investment facilitation and investment promotion are different. Promotion is more cost intensive and at the end it comes to be marketing. <coughs> facilitation is, however, a whole of government approach like Anktat says, our, our partners. Uh, so put it as at all levels, less competitive. Uh, so, uh, intensive but cost effective. So, to make it easier to invest and to do business. So, energy also plays a huge role currently, to name just a few examples. Uh, uh, one could undertake environmental remediation activities or adapt manufacturing uh, to use alternate energy sources such as solar, wind, geothermal. And it should be holistic approach. So it means that there has to be a clear national or regional strategy, and all stakeholders should have the same direction. So one of the most important role of I IPAs is policy advocacy, although many might not agree. And they don't have many times empowerment to be able to uh, make policy advocacy. They can objectively transmit the voice of investors directly from the ground to policy makers to then find the common strategy. An IPA focusing on of sustainable investments while their government is not providing them with proper support and framework will definitely not work at all or effectively to say the least. Uh, they can take 
an active role for the promotion and facilitation of sustainable investments. Capacity developments and empowerment of IPAs, as I said before, is the key. So how we try to empower them, we are trying to do this through our consultative committee. So uh, uh, our UNCTAD, UNIDO, so all, um, let's say, OECD, all the powerhouses which help us to empower the IPAs. Uh, we recently had a meeting in New York where we would like to uh, uh, go with one project that we designed that will especially empower the LDC IPAs, which we believe they need the most of uh, assistance of, uh, of uh, us and other um, agencies, uh, intergovernmental agencies. And the uh, focus should be clear and the IPA strategy defined and tailor-made. And uh, one-size-fits-all approach we should definitely avoid. Uh, by providing targeted support, the IPA can help the investor to identify opportunities for adding certain functions or activities to their initial investment plan to be able to invest into sustainable projects. Uh, facilitation can even create opportunities for investment where none previously existed. This happens when the IPAs assist an investor to uncover or access opportunities that the investor would not have been able to identify or take advantage of without the IPA support. Uh, and lastly, I would say a sound feedback mechanism will indeed help to create much business-friendly investment environment regulatory facilitation steps. Uh, if I say shortly, private sector mindset is the key while offering operation, uh, operational facilitation services. I would like to say at the end uh, a concrete example. Um, they asked me to say one concrete example about what, how it means like a sustainable investment facilitation from one of our members. And this was with their consent example from South Africa, um, where the company, which is uh, working in renewable industries, uh, and uh, this project that happened in South Africa contributes directly to SDG 7, 8, 9 and 13. With this example, I will try to illustrate my earlier points, what I was saying in terms of a holistic approach by the government and the IPA regarding their strategy to enable and enhance sustainable investments. So in the first three rounds of the South African uh, Government Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program, it's a very long name, uh, 19 wind projects were approved, and it is estimated that these projects combined would use approximately 70, 740 wind towers. For many of the projects in the first and second rounds, these towers were fully imported uh, and had to be transported to the different project sites, contributing greatly to the carbon footprint of the project, which we would like, to, of course, to avoid. However, with the establishment of a second local wind tower manufacturing uh, facility locally, the carbon footprint of the wind farms are drastically reduced and towers only need to be transported locally. So this was like attraction. And then we come to facilitation and uh, um, the agency in West South Africa facilitated meetings which took place between uh, the company and the government departments and funding institutions such as Department of Energy, National Treasury and the Industrial Development Corporation. So the project was realized and then we come to the aftercare. So uh, they supported the company in the process of expanding one of their uh, factories and they also uh, offered them a tax incentives uh, from, uh, of course, this was all possible because they were coordinating uh, all other stakeholders within the governmental structure. So let me conclude. All in all, it can be said that investment in the SDGs requires enhanced facilitation. Investment in many SDG sectors, such as water, electricity, healthcare, and education, involves the provision of public services and tends to be more intensively regulated. In cases where policy uncertainties are hindering investment in SDG, in SDG projects, project preparation and packaging can improve project visibility, speed up project implementation and reduce project risks. We also see that in our above example. Equal, equally important to sustainable development are technology, upgrading, innovation and the introduction of green technologies. So the last sentence that I would say IPAs should definitely be more empowered, should definitely be independent, and should have the opportunity to feedback their respective governments to be able to create proper uh, policy framework and legal framework 
uh, so proper investments would be uh, created uh, through the investors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bastian. And I think for your presentation, it's, 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 it's a very evident the gap that we have between, of course, the policy conversation and the actual implementation. And I think th th these are the things that, uh, of course, the discussions at this house and, 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 and really what the trajectory we are undertaking with the Netherlands and ICTSD uh, is, trying to, is trying to bring closer. And in that regard, I think we're very thankful for, for the participation of WIPA and people working actually on investment facilitation on the ground and the businesses, uh, really, which I think are essential and complementary to, to this discussion between just between policymakers, which, which, which will create the frameworks. Uh, with that, uh, we have uh, still a bit of time, so let me just uh, give it directly to the audience. And if you could just, uh, before phrasing a question, identify yourself and, and your affiliation. Uh, hi, um, Hege from Speeder Norway. Uh, I have a question uh, mostly to you, Anna. Uh, you talk about the responsibility in global value chains uh, and as a concern, international transport is one of the main emitters in the world, and by means, if it if it continues the way it does today, by 2050, it will be uh, responsible for about 40% of uh, greenhouse gases in the world. Uh, I'm just wondering, as it has been a standstill in the IMO and the ICAO for a while on how to regulate these emissions, how do you see uh, this responsibility being taken from these? Uh, these emitters. Thank you. Very particular question. Uh, I have to say that uh, in the OECD we are working, we are working, we are trying to coordinate. Don't believe that the governments are the only ones that have problem of coordination internally. But uh, we have, but we are trying to solve it because we know that the work together is the way that we have to deal with this kind of problem. In this kind of particular issue of, of that you mentioned, we, we, we are working with the environment and the, with the ITFC, the transport. And then what we are trying to, to show is like it's possible. We, we have a last report about investment in growth, investment in climate. That means that how you can build systems or, or do actions that will not decrease the, the, the growth, but will allow you to tackle this kind of, uh, of, of low emissions and then invest in the... Ma many, many of the work that we're doing is like how you, if you start to invest in infrastructure and then you try to change the transfer in the way that is already changing in a way that is, it will be with low emission by definition because of the way that you are doing these things, then you will continue growing, but at the same time, you will diminish this kind of, 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 uh, of uh, contamination or pollution. But we are working more in this plane, in, in this sector. I would say that in the responsible business conduct that we are working more with business, we are not tackling the transport in particular. Uh, of course, these standards apply to all sectors, and, uh, and we are developing right now a due diligence that is for all sectors, but we have been focused more in the mining, in the textile, in the agriculture, now something on finance, not too much on transport, even though that applies to transport too. And I would say that the question that you make, we are working more with the environment in transport in this kind of changing the way of transport, changing the way of infrastructure, and then trying to com combine investment in growth and investment in, in climate at the same time. Mm -hmm. With the additional complication that this is really conversation hosted at ICAO and, and, and IMO, but not really at the UNFCCC, right? So, a um, lot of a lot of forums out there. Uh, any other questions, please, for any of the speakers, sir? Please. Thank you. I'm uh, Suleiman Audrey from Nigeria Mission, and I wish to quickly uh, pay compliments to the distinguished panelists for very, very excellent and insightful presentation. My quick question goes to uh, the the president of uh, the uh, World Association of Invest. Oh, sorry, the chief executive of WASPA or WIPA. I'm sorry. I just want to be clear as to when you say the IPA should be independent of what of government. One and two. If you say feedback will be necessary to enable them create proper framework, feedback from stakeholder, from government, from where? And I think the third one relates to the interagency cooperation. IPAs alone cannot function. They will need to function in collaboration with the rest of the agencies. And I want to know precisely what do you think should be the re the role of other agencies that need to collaborate with IPAs. I think. Thank you for the question. I would try to answer simply from my uh, private experience. I was head of an IPA uh, for some couple of years. Um, 
What I meant with IPA is to be independent. I meant that when once there is a yearly plan done and the budget proposed, that they are not influenced from the other stakeholders, especially not with the political changes, which is uh, in many times the case. So when the one uh, establishment changes, the IPA cannot proceed with, with uh, priorly established uh, plan and the budget. So they are ma many times burdened with the political issues and instability in the countries. This is what I meant independence. So they can decide when the budget and plan are confirmed. Uh, what I meant with, uh, let's say, feedback, I meant in a manner that uh, the authorities who are responsible, so let's say either ministry or governments, uh, should listen uh, uh, what IPAs brings back from the investor's perspective. They are serving to the investors and the investors has some complaints, so they should embed these complaints uh, to the policy framework uh, preparations. Uh, the last question was, one more you said, the third one. Uh, Okay, I guess uh, uh, collaboration, in any case, uh, they would never be totally independent because this is not possible. But they should somehow be close to the one-stop shop approach, which will enable them to be able to really coordinate all kinds of services to the investors. It means like also with the labor ministry for the, uh, let's say, uh, work permits, uh, let's say permits for the constructions and all these things. So they will uh, put together the ropes from the different kind of stakeholders to uh, give one common solution to the investor. Let me take maybe uh, two or three questions together, uh, sir, please. And I'll take another one uh, right away. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, we have to distinguish uh, between different set of factors that affect investment environment in different countries. There is uh, what I would call uh, controllable factors or elements and non-controllable factors. What I, what I mean by non-controllable, each country in its location, for example, take my country case, uh, Jordan, uh, it's located in the Middle East, and we have uh, almost four wars in all countries surrounding to Jordan. So that uh, affects negatively all investment environment in tourism, in exports, in everything. So uh, in, in such situation, I think it's very difficult to facilitate uh, trade and investment for sustainable development. Uh, we have tried, of course, uh, incentives, uh, granting incentives for investment, uh, cutting down red tapes, uh, all, all kind of remedies that we have uh, recommended by different international institutions like IMF, World Trade Organizations. But uh, actually, uh, since 20 years, things are not developing as we have hoped. So I wonder whether this tool of box would apply in this case, or if anyone of the distinguished panelists can provide a good, modest recommendation in this case. Thank you. Let, let, let me take maybe one more question, and maybe Howard, you can comment on that one. Um, but if I can take maybe another question from the uh, Felipe, Felipe has a, a very good friend of the of the trajectory. Thank you, thank you very much. Actually, I would like to comment on something that Bostian said, and, and I think it's particularly useful in this discussion. First one is the distinction between promotion and facilitation. I think this is crucial because otherwise, it, if we start using this as, as synonyms, I think we are going to miss the point. But even if we concentrate on facilitation as a distinct issue regarding uh, promotion, there are different layers of facilitation. We, we, we still mean different things under facilitation. And I think that the sentence that you use is a very good one. And here comes the question. I mean, you said that uh, the IPAs should work very close to the single entry point, to the more procedural side of, of, of the investment process of, of, of coming and establishing in the host country. So uh, it's just to get your, your inputs about 
some facilitating work an IPA can, can, can do, but it's not exhausting the facilitation sort of initiative that you can have in order really to make things even more facilitating to, to investment to investors and to the host government because it's something that has to come together. It cannot only benefit one side. So if you have some more thoughts to share about these different layers of facilitation and up to the point that the IPAs go and what could be added to this. Thank you. Maybe I'll take one more. I have Howard and Bastian uh, waiting for answers, and maybe I'll take one more question, or uh, let's just go to Bastian. Let me try to answer like this. Um, it will never be ideal, of course, but if we work hand in hand, especially IPAs and governments and investors, so IPA is kind of a bridge between investor and government, and of course the first task comes uh, to the governments to properly prepare the um, business environment and also prioritize sectors. And we many times here, we have a priority sectors and they come to 15 priority sectors. Uh, so it means that there is already the, the gap in the, the strategy planning. So um, an IPA through the experiences with the investors uh, can understand what kind of investors are looking to the, their particular country. So this is what I meant before with the feedback to give to give to government uh, and to all the relevant institutions the proper feedback to create a, a strategy and policy that will in the long term enable sustainable investments. This is I hope I answered. Howard, let me go to you. I, I think you have to unmute your uh, your mic. Unmute your mic. I just did. I hope you can hear me now. Perfect. Okay. Um, I, I guess just a couple of, of overall comments, maybe not quite questions, but um, yes, some factors are controllable, some factors are not controllable, um, and um, here we do come to a question of what type of investments are you trying to facilitate? Are you trying to promote? And I, I think that we do need to have see investment facilitation as part of a larger strategy. Um, but I also think we need to make sure that we don't go back to kind of the investment policy frameworks of the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, that focused entirely and, and only on what was defined as the investment environment. Um, when we look at the scope of investment, what does it mean to talk about investment for sustainable development today? Even the notion that investment is all about the investor has to be challenged and looked at critically. Yes, the investor is clearly a critical component of any type of investment facilitation, investment promotion, investment regime. But how that investor and its investment interact with other economic and social stakeholders is equally critical, and those stakeholders have to be understood as a critical part of the equation, or we will never get to uh, the promotion of investment for sustainable development, taking that term as a whole. What we can't go back and do, I fear, or, uh, in, in my view, is assume that all investment leads to sustainable development. That was an assumption that was made 20 years ago. All investment is good investment. All investment promotes sustainable development. But we know that that assumption isn't true. So when we talk about facilitation today, when we talk about promotion, how do we create the mechanisms that are facilitating and promoting that those kinds of investments that do contribute to sustainable development within the host country and at a global level when we talk about things like climate change, to me is the critical, the critical equation and the critical issue. So I, I, I guess I'm supporting the idea that, that we can't conflate investment promotion with investment facilitation or not the same. We also can't conflate the investment environment with investment facilitation. Again, those are not the same, especially when you're talking about a sustainable development context. I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, 
Sure. I mean, we have. Uh, it, it, it's basically how long do you want to uh, proceed to the aperitif? But, but, but oh, I just of course, want to it react to Howard, not, just to make it a little more interactive. But but I think that the question is not that in the in the 90s we believed that all investment was good. I will say that today all investment could be good too. It's it's a way of the policy framework that you have, what are the standards that are there, and also the responsible business conduct issue. I think that all investment could be good. In fact, it's not a fact, but could be good in a way like it's depending on, 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 the, on the context. But this is something that we can continue discussing over. And, and, and as we approach uh, to the end of the panel, I think I'll just offer, uh, offer, offer uh, the microphone for, for maybe quick reactions and uh, Ambassador Rosagua. Um, we we had a last final. Maybe we can host a very final question if we. Huh? Yeah. So let me let me offer the word to Ambassador Sagu for for a final reaction. I I spoke I spoke very long ago that I some things have been clarified in my mind listening to the panel. One observation I'll make from what I've heard from fellow panelists is that I hear a repeat of the different polarities. I hear a repeat, sorry, I, I, I hear a repeat of the different polarities between uh, the investment uh, community on the one hand, other communities on the one hand, and the trade policy community on the other hand. I can hear the attention as I sat and I was taking notes. The question we have to ask with regard to these tensions and polarities, and I had it very clearly, is why has the issue of investment facilitation been brought into the WTO? You have to think about that question. And the reason is because those in the investment promotion, qua investment promotion community, cannot implement the things they're doing. I know that from a national perspective. Because it's in such a silo, lacking to a large extent a horizontal and systemic application that they're playing a lot of handicaps. So to be able to deal with investment promotion or investment facilitation, you have to couple it to trade. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Hmm? I think you better take that away. I've done 19 years of international organization work. I'm back to the front lines in a national capital, and I know exactly how this works. If you decouple investment promotion or investment facilitation, whatever, how, however you define it, it will stay where it is, unimplementable, except in the most minimalist um, effect with perverse outcomes. Secondly, let me uh, address the question that was raised by Jordan and not answered, uh, not answered. For any policy to work, move beyond civil society, move beyond international civil servants, come back into a national environment. For any policy to work, you must be able to figure out the coefficients that will be introduced from the political economy. Otherwise, it has no chance. Let me repeat that. If um, Let me say it differently, but say the same thing. If you take any policy and you don't plant it in a political economy, in terms of the priorities of the political economy, no chance. It's not going to work. It's not a question of drop-down menus and toolkits. It doesn't work that way. If you actually do national work, it doesn't work that way. You have to fit it in to the priorities that have been defined by an economy, and this is the brilliance and the originality of the unanswered question from Jordan, you have to figure out the national priorities. So whether it's an enabling business environment, whether it's dealing with poverty, whether it's dealing with growth, if it's dealing with job creation, you have to plan that policy into the political economy, otherwise, 
tant pis, ça ne va pas marcher. Je vous dis, franchement et directement, ça ne va pas marcher. The third point is, and this is a point that I made at the beginning, there is urgency to this. There is urgency to this. Because the overarching priorities, and you have to download sustainable development. You have to download it. You have to break it down. What are the real challenges? What are the, the overriding challenges now? Jobs, the economy, poverty reduction, a population crisis. And you can apply an intellectual argument to this. You won't have a sustainable development until societies or economies grow richer. I don't want to call or identify any of the domestic economic arguments that you hear all the time. Last week, I sat for one week with the Nigerian president in the UN General Assembly listening to what heads of government were saying basically listening to their priorities on which they touch on the basic things that they would like to connect and relate to issues such as investment. It has to do with creation of jobs. It has to do with reducing poverty. It has to do with growth rates. If investment promotion or facilitation does not serve these objectives, it won't work. It's not about toolkits. It's not about menus. They're useful in a sort of heuristic, academic, if you like, some sort of pedagogical way of dealing with this. But you have to download this and bring it down to a practical level. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Uh, two final points. There is relevance and there is validity for a negotiated multilateral framework on investment facilitation. Nigeria will push this, we will push this, and we're ready to push this with a coalition of friends. And why will we do this? We will do this because there is a need to, in a sense, distill, and I'm using the data from this panel, 3,324 international investment agreements. You have to distill the juice in it and bring it down into some sort of coherent package across the board, trade, investment, and other things for a multilateral investment that, that drives growth. And I think that's useful. I don't, do, I don't do adverts, but I should say that on the second and 3rd of November in Abuja, Nigeria. Nigeria will be co-hosting with the ECOWAS Commission, co-hosting with the WTO Friends of Investment Facilitation for Development, a high-level policy and private sector activity on investment facilitation for development. And since you've just reminded me about the importance of sustainability, I think we'll tack in that word also. <laughs> Fantastic, and we, we, we hope to, we all hope to be able to join you in Abuja for that very, very relevant conference preceding the discussions in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, we have come uh, almost to our near, the end of our time, but uh, Martin, if you could help us, you know, wrapping up the discussion, and I think also uh, with your takeaways for the ongoing work that we have together on trying to, to, to advance this topic. Well, thank you, uh, Christian, and doing that only in two minutes, that's a high ambition you, as well. You but, can do four. Uh, four. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, I think it's a very, what we had was a very uh, good and a extremely relevant discussion, but it made a few things very clear. I think we all share a very high ambitions. Uh, and we also know that we do many part, need many partners to tango. We have to do it all together and we all have a responsibility in this. It is, I think, a very complex march uh, and I think time is not on our side. Uh, especially if you talk about a population crisis, as Ambassador did, and I've, uh, I, I think uh, I, th I agree with him that we really need urgency in this whole process. 
I think uh, what we discussed today is that the, the process of finding characteristics of sustainability is very helpful. Uh, and the discussion uh, on the investment facilitation is extremely relevant. Uh, the guiding principles, supporting national governments, uh, what mechanism are needed to get sustainable investment. The discussion we had in G20, the WTO uh, investment facilitation discussion, I think all small steps in a, as I said, a complex march, but also a very needed step. I think it's also important to share best practices from each other, to learn from each other. Uh, and definitely uh, we have to include the private sector. On the one hand, uh, as Anna told us about the responsible business, uh, for the responsible business for supply chains, those the guidelines I think extremely helpful in that. But also, uh, as was said, uh, that we need the dialogue with the private sector. Uh, the dialogue on how to get uh, sustainable investment, how to facilitate inv sustainable investment. And I couldn't agree more that we need, on the one hand, a whole of government approach. And if you ask uh, a policymaker whether a policy works, it, there, the answer should al always be, it depends. I very much agree with the ambassador. It only depends in a certain, it only works in a certain specific context in the political economy. If you don't, do not take into account, you will never be uh, successful. The proof the pudding is in the eating, I think with this in the implementation. Uh, so that's very, very important. And just to finalize with one uh, example of the Netherlands, uh, how, to, how important it is to include all the relevant stakeholders to reach sustainability. Uh, about two years ago, we ag agreed on a very, very ambitious energy agreement. Uh, that was a whole of government approach. It took of us about half a year to have discussions with governments on a national and a local level, with the private sector, with knowledge institutes, with NGOs, environmental groups, with trade unions. That was really a whole um, approach. Everybody included, everybody agreed, everybody signed a very ambitious energy agreement about renewable energy. And two years later, we can see it's very successful in uh, getting the business model, the business case in renewable energy, to really uh, be more ambitious in renewable energy, to have sound economic policies, and also in the end, maybe exporting the, this, but that it's also to our own interest. But just to show that if you have, you, you need all the relevant stakeholders together in a dialogue, and that's the only way, I think, to get successful. And we had, uh, when we came in, there was a very, it was a small baby here or a small child here. That's why we do it and why we have no time in our side. We really get our act together on sustainability of investment. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all, all our panelists today for a fantastic discussion, the, the audience. Uh, reassure you that the, the trajectory, uh, the trajectory for, for, sustainable, uh, for sustainable investment for development uh, will try to continue to, to develop uh, outcomes and recommendations that be really a hosting space uh, for friends at the WTO and, and beyond uh, to keep and, 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 and push these conversations, of course, for, for what we could expect at MC11, but very much beyond. Uh, with that, just... Uh, a, 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 a very uh, quick uh, thank you also to, to my colleagues uh, Rashmi Jose and Aditi Vergese from the ICTSD and the World Economic Forum, which have been behind the organization of this, and of course the permanent mission of the Netherlands uh, here, uh, which has been uh, sponsoring this panel and, 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 and tremendously supportive.